trees within. And uh, one tree that I recognize is actually called the ash tree. And that tree I recognize because I've had one growing outside my childhood home for as long as I can remember. The Humber River also runs through the grounds of the school that I teach at. So that's pretty cool. And I like to take my students out there sometimes to have, have some time spending outdoors and learning outdoors. We know outdoor learning comes with great benefits for both your mind and your body. It gets you outside and encourages you to be physically active while spending time in nature. Okay. Taking the silver lining actually from the two years that we spent now in this pandemic, we're excited to be able to offer these workshops virtually, which is the silver lining because it enables us all across Canada to join together um, especially those who are more remote or underrepresented. So even though this webinar is online today, today and every day, we encourage you to get outside, learn something new, spend time outdoors, breathe in some nice fresh air and detach from screen time. So for those of you just joining us, welcome again. Um, maybe some of you were in our yoga session this morning. So if you were, it's a great start to the day pumping um, the blood through your body, relaxing, breathing. So thanks again for joining us if you were in that session earlier. Some Zoom 101 to get acquainted with the webinar uh, format. The chat feature will be turned on later in the presentation and I'll announce when the chat feature will be turned on for some discussion. Uh, your video and your mic are automatically muted as part of that webinar feature. Okay, so you don't have to worry about those. We'll have our presentations here with the, uh, the, the athlete as our panelists and um, some question and, a, uh, question and answers to follow. We'll have a closing circle and at the end, prizes. We'll be announcing some prizes. So make sure you stay till the end to see if you win uh, any prizes. The session is being recorded. Okay, so if uh, you know someone that wasn't able to make it to the session, or if you're not able to stay for the full session, not to worry, you will have access to this recording on our website by tomorrow. Also, if you'd like to further your learning in the outdoors, um, please take a look at our activity blogs on our website and you'll, you'll see some activities um, from our supporting partners on there that you can engage your class in as well. All right. This is an excellent turnout. We're so happy to see everyone joining today. Um, and we are absolutely honored to introduce to you our Canadian Olympic athlete panel, who are our, all here with us today to discuss the connection between mental and physical health and the outdoors. So as I introduce your name panelists, please give us a wave so we know who's who. All right, so today we have here with us alumni of the Canadian National Cross Country Ski Team and two-time Winter Olympian, Jesse Cockney. Hi, Jesse. Member of the Canadian National Rowing Team member and Tokyo Summer Olympian, Christina Walker. Hello, Christina. Member of the Canadian Senior National Biathlon Team and 2018 Winter Olympian, Megan Banks. Hello, Megan. Canadian national Paranordic athlete and three-time Paralympian, Mark Arends. Hello, Mark. <laughs> and the facilitator of our conversation today, as well as 2014 Winter Olympian for cross-country skiing, skiing, Heidi Winmer. Hello, Heidi. All right, thank you all for being with us today. We're super lucky and we feel really lucky to have each of you uh, joining us from different parts of the country today. Heidi, the panelist who was waving her hand, she's joining us from the Rocky Mountains today and she's going to help guide our conversation on the connection between mental and physical health and the outdoors. Over to you, Heidi. Awesome. Thanks for the introduction, Stephanie. Hello to all of those names in the participant list. I know there's a lot more faces behind all of those names, so thank you to each and every one of you for making the time to be here today. As Stephanie mentioned, I am in the Canadian Rockies. I share this place with Douglas Fir, with Grizzly Bear, with the Bow River. 
and a little bit of blue sky today as well. And I'm excited to be here to hang out uh, with some fellow athletes this afternoon and have a little bit of fun because I like to play games. And to me, cross country ski racing was one big game. Um, and because we can't be together to play a game today, I'd still like you to feel a part of this whole conversation. So as we go along, every time an athlete on our panel says something that is similar to you, you can either tap your nose, you can put a mark on a piece of paper, you can count it on your fingers. Because sometimes we think that athletes are, you know, so different from us. We're really good at being fast, we're really good at being happy people most of the time. And we are, we're really good at all these things, but we also fall down. We pick our noses, we put our clothes on the wrong way. We walk to school, we ride our bikes and we love to play hide and seek. So there's whole other 99% of us that's quite similar to you. So keep track of those things that are similar to you and we won't have time to share them today, but maybe you can share them with some of your friends. Maybe you can share them with your class uh, because us on the panel as athletes were not as dissimilar to you as you may think. All right, my friends are waiting. Christina, Mark, Megan, and Jess. I'm gonna start this conversation with a sharing circle. And before we begin, I asked each of the panelists to pick something from their backyard. So we'll show our item from our backyard. And I'd love for each of us to begin with a childhood memory, a place, a special place that you liked to go and play when you were a kid. So I'll begin. And then as I see it on my screen, I have um, Mark is right next to me. So I'll pass the item to Mark. Mark will receive it and then pass it again. And then whoever finishes can just pass it back to me. So my name is Heidi. I found this rose hip in my backyard where I live in Kenmore. And a special place that I liked to go as a kid was in my backyard where I would make mud pies and spaghetti pies. And I had a, you know, a whole world that was a pretend restaurant. And I felt it was completely secluded and separate from, from my, my house and my school. So my backyard was my special place. All right, over to you, Mark. Well, thank Magic. you. So this is a little piece of coal. And when I found it, I just looked like a something precious, like if from a movie. And um, it's especially from the movie Avatar. So it made me think of the uh, unatanium. And so that's why my this is my little special piece. And for me, growing up, my uh, a place that I loved playing was this wall of trees my dad had planted when he had first got onto the property, the farm that I live on. And it was just this uh, mountain of, or a little dirt mound of dirt and then trees kind of to break the wind in PEI. And this plane in there and the different size trees, and it was kind of just my secluded little special place that I could play around in. And, and create up all these different adventures, whether I was in Narnia one year or day or somewhere else another day. And that's why it was so special to me. So I'll pass this on, I think, to Christina. Awesome, thank you, Mark. Uh, hi, everyone, my name is Christina and this is actually a sage plant. So it's an indigenous medicinal plant. Uh, it's one of my favorite herbs and I use it often to cook. Uh, I love to cook as an athlete and just as a person in general, it's one of my favorite hobbies. Um, but this kind of brought me back to my home, which is a farm on Wolf Island. Um, it's just off the shore of Kingston, Ontario. It's the largest of the Thousand Islands. And my family owns this farm um, and it's actually called the Wolf Island Corn Maze. And so I grew up uh, at this farm where we would create a corn maze every summer and have students and people come over and it was a business. And so um, that was one of my favorite memories is just being outdoors and helping my family create this maze with corn, as well as um, just getting to share our property with so many other people um, and enjoy 
what the great outdoors has for everybody. So I'm going to pass mine back to Megan. Super. Thanks, Chris. Uh, here we go. I have a part of a robin's nest that I found just under um, my deck outside here. Uh, usually every spring robins come and this year they built sort of three different nests and none of them were totally complete. So don't really know how that went, but uh, yeah. So I've got this one here and I'll put it back out there after this meeting um, so that if they want to use it next year, they can. Um, yeah, my one of my favorite places to play when I was uh, younger outside was in my yard. I grew up in Calgary and my brother and I, depending on the season, would play all sorts of different games. Uh, we usually build forts out of um, found different like bits of wood um, and kind of make up different games that we play in them. Or if it was the winter, we had a bit of a hill and I'd create an elaborate um, sled run um, or in the fall just rake up huge quantities of leaves and then jump into those piles. So there was always something to do. So had lots of fun there. And yeah, I guess I will pass this on to Jess. Oh. Sweet. Well, I found one of uh, those leaves in Calgary that you were jumping into, Megan, because this is a leaf that I picked up on my walk back from school. I go to the University of Calgary and study kinesiology, um, and I live really close by, and there's a lot of leaves on the walk right now, and it's just pretty nice to feel like a kid kick through the leaves a little bit as I walk over to school or walk home. Um, and it kind of transports me back to feeling like a kid, um, which makes me feel like I'm back in Yellowknife where I grew up until I was seven years old uh, with my family and specifically my backyard because it felt like my backyard in Yellowknife was like the whole world. We backed onto a lake, a forest, a little swamp and uh, uh, great memories that I have are playing back there with my sister and specifically uh, playing in the swamp and looking for cloud berries. They're these little berries that um, are like golden orange and they point right up to the sky. Uh, and yeah, that was just good times, good connections in, in our backyard as a kid and nice to be able to explore wild space in your own backyard. Now I'll take the item back from Jess. Thanks, Jess and Megan, Mark, and Christina to you. And Jess, you mentioned growing up in Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories. And I know that you're also part Inu and you have a name in Inu Um I was, I was wondering if you'd share your name with us and, and what it means to you. Yeah, it, um, my middle name is Siku Psukti. And it literally translates to ice walker. Um, and you could kind of refer to a polar bear as an ice walker. So in a little bit of a roundabout way, it, it, it's my middle name is polar bear in that way. And um, yeah, kind of like that visual of being a cross country skier and think of those tough skiing conditions where it just feels like ice and feel like I, I was built for this. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. And it's so fascinating how, you know, names not only connect us to places and those places also connect us to one another and it kind of just keeps going back again. So thanks, Jess. And speaking of ice and speaking of winter and speaking of being Canadian, um, I think all of us have in one way or another experienced being cold. Um, I was wondering, Mark, with your experience as a winter athlete, a three-time Paralympian, You've won the most, uh, most medals at a single game for any Canadian Paralympian. So that's six medals in one games. And you were the flag bearer at the closing ceremonies. This may take a lot of time outdoors, as well as outdoors being when you're cold. And you also mentioned that you grew up in Prince Edward Island, and they definitely get winter. So I'm wondering, what do you do when you get cold? Uh, most of the time it's actually go ski a little faster. Um, uh, that's the easy answer, but, uh, sometimes you just don't have that option. And it's just about, um, trying to really think about 
moving those little tiny muscles at the very tips of your fingers or the tips of your toes and just make sure everything keeps moving. And that way you bring the blood to those, but you also start, you're kind of really getting that sensation of feeling your whole body and, and the experience of what you're doing and where you are. Um, you know, sometimes getting too cold is not that good. But uh, yeah, for me, it's always been about just being prepared for being outdoors because the outdoors are a little unpredictable. Um, but if you're ready for them and you have these little tricks, lots of arm circles too, uh, to warm up the hand, uh, for me, have always been a, a big key part. You see the skiers or biathletes going by and they're always spinning their hands if it's cold. So uh, for me, uh, those have always been the tricks uh, that I've used. The one place in PEI is actually a lot colder than I um, growing up than coming to Alberta, where it actually the temperature got colder, but it didn't feel as cold. The, the cold in PEI just always felt a little more because of the humidity just felt colder. And you, there were times where you just couldn't warm up no matter what you did. Um, but I think for me, those were the challenges of to keep going, to make sure, again, that I wasn't putting myself in danger, but I kept going and I was able to push through these, that obstacle of that feeling cold and to push through to, to find something enjoyable in the moment. Oh, thanks for sharing. Lots of arm circles, lots of little tiny movements. Awesome. And Christina, you know, even though you're a summer athlete, I imagine there's mornings where you're out on the water or your hand, you know, dips into colder water. You know, how do you, how do you keep yourself motivated to go outside when ugh, it's sometimes not very comfortable? Great question. Um, yeah, we get some pretty rough, uh, uh, weather conditions with rowing sometimes in the winter, like it can be with our sport. We, we wake up very early, especially when I was in university and I'm actually coaching currently right now where we have to wake up at four 30 every morning. And so we're out in the water at five and we're out there for two and a half hours. And, um, yeah, it's, it's cold and it's dark and often you just can't see anything. Um, but I think it's the aspect of being with your team and knowing that everybody else is doing it too, um, allows you to push forward and you don't even really question. So knowing that like you have that commitment of to somebody else that if you're not going to be there this morning, then that crew boat won't be able to go out. And I think that's always kind of been an important idea behind rowing is you really need each other in order to do the sport. Um, and so I'm trying to think there was one time we're actually, so usually actually we get, when it's really cold, we put on these, uh, on this, it's kind of like a glove that goes over our oars and it's, they're called pogies. Um, they're kind of, they're kind of funny, but, uh, one morning I didn't bring my pogies and it was like, I don't know, negative two. And I remember my hands got so cold that I was kind of going into like hyperthermia and I just started kind of crying. It was so wild. Um, but once again, I had my teammates that kind of, one of them that was sitting in front of me turned around and was like, it's okay. And then handed me their pogies. Um, and so, yeah, I think, uh, going through that, those conditions as a team is so important because for me to go out there every day, by myself, uh, I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Having friends along the way, uh, that's, so important to it. I mean, I know Megan has numerous teammates. She grew up in Calgary, but you've traveled to so you know Slovakia, Germany, France, and you have a team that you do this with. But you also have a rifle on your back, and this rifle on her back, she has. Megan has to ski really fast, and Mark as well. Ski really fast. Take this rifle off of their back with cold metal parts on it. I might add, and then shoot something that's so tiny about the equivalent to like three and a half school bus lengths away. Um, so I'm wondering, Megan, what keeps you motivated when, when it's cold and when the wind is blowing sideways and it's not so comfortable? Yeah, for sure. Definitely have had some interesting race experiences um, with, with the cold. Um, a lot of the time when I'm racing in Europe, it's actually a lot warmer than it is in uh, Canada. Uh, but a couple of years ago, we had a World Cup in Canmore here, uh, which was really exciting for everyone. Um, but the downside was, I think it was 
it was about minus 20 to minus 30 the whole week. <laughs> um, so they had to cancel some of the races, but um, for me, I was just so excited to get to race in front of um, like my family and <laughs> people, um, like all my supporters from like when I was growing up and everything. So um, yeah, I definitely was like, okay, it's freezing, but what can I do? I'll put on all the layers I can, um, warm up as well as I can. You know, I only have to be out there for 20, 30 minutes um, and then just try and do my best. And yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely challenging, but like Christina said, having other people out there sort of going through the same thing as you, it really makes it um, a little bit easier. Sometimes it's still hard, but I would say in Camor, especially on those minus 30 days, it's usually so beautiful. It's usually clear, blue, crisp, and you can see the ice crystals like in the air because it's so cold. So everything kind of sparkles. Um, and if you can get outside, even if you're totally bundled up and if you're moving a little bit, it's usually pretty nice to be out, not for too long, but for, for just long enough to experience all that. Yeah. Awesome. And to have some friends to do it along with, to motivate yourself to it with your friends around you and family. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. It's funny. Each of us are kind of smiling as we're saying these stories, but you know, I can imagine having hypothermic hands, like you'd kind of be you know, smile crying at the same time. And each of us, you know, have our own stories of, of physical discomfort, but, you know, each of us are smiling in the end and, and talk about, you know, Mark bringing sensation back to his fingers and to the smaller muscles in his body. Like we think about our physical health, but it's also, you know, a big part is our mental health. And for some of us, we think mental health is, you know, only think positive, you know, good thoughts and be really happy all the time all the time, that's, that's mental health. Or some of us might think of it as being able to make yourself happy when you're feeling sad. And for me, mental health is all of this. And, and it also it includes our emotions, it includes our relationships to others. And because we're talking about our mental health here, as well as our physical health in relation to the outdoors, I think it's important to talk about all of these different facets of it. And it it's like these athletes here are, are training their physical muscles and, and our mental health is truly what I consider a muscle as well. When I trained my legs to be stronger and more efficient, it's the same as what I do for my brain and for my, my emotions. When, I, when I'm hurt and physically injured, you know, I wouldn't think of going out and just pretending I'm not injured and hurt because I know that would lead to more injury. So it's the same when I feel sad or, or upset. If I were to just ignore that, I make myself more upset and more angry that comes out, you know, in my emotions to other, maybe I'm rude to a teammate or maybe I'm, you know, talking negative to myself. And, and each of these athletes have had, had their own, you know, successes and, and failures or, or missed, missed opportunities as well. And, you know, you have success, like, you know, you're the first one to cross the line of winning gold. And that's what every athlete dreams of. You also have disappointment and I've had, you know, my, a lot of my fair share uh, as well when it comes to not reaching your goals. And we can call it many things, but this ability is a real skill um, to take an upsetting situation and then to turn it into something positive or something to learn from. And, and I like to call this resilience, um, but lots of people call it many different things, optimism, um, and I'd like to ask Mark, uh, I, you can't see it in your screen, but Mark has one arm that's full length and the other arm, yeah. Thanks, Mark. Um, and I'm wondering, Mark, maybe you could share with us a little bit about how you lost your one arm and, and what you're able to do with your body now. Oh yeah, of course. Um, so when I was seven years old, I was, as I said before, on the family farm, helping my dad out. and. Uh, I walked by a grain auger and I saw some grain wasn't quite flowing into the machine. So I decided I would help, help out, you know, helping my dad. And I gave it a little push with my hand. Um, but as I did this, I kind of leaned over and started to lose my balance. And to catch my fall, I actually shot both of my hands out to slow my fall, to stop my fall. 
Um, my right hand was fine. It, land, it was it landed safely, but my left hand landed on the blades of the auger. And uh, it just grabbed my arm and pulled it right in. And so I was stuck in the machine all the way up to my shoulder. And luckily the truck driver realized something was wrong and, and decided to, and jumped on the machine, stopped the machine. And um, over the next few days, um, I was rushed to the hospital. Uh, and they just couldn't, they tried to save as much as my arm as they could. Um, but unfortunately they had to amputate just above the elbow. So I don't have my left elbow. I just have everything above that. And at first I didn't believe them because I could still feel my hand. I could still feel my arm and everything. And it wasn't until I actually saw my arm. And I think some, that was really powerful for me to actually see my arm for the first time and you know, finally let my mind actually realize that, um, that like the op optimism um, that Heidi was talking about, like, oh, I was fine, you know, it's just in a big cast in six weeks, I'll be fine. Um, but it was that realization when I first saw my, what was left of my arm, that it's like, no, this is different. And it took, you know, years, and there's still little things that I can't do, monkey bars, I'm no good at the monkey bars. Um, but over the years, I've learned how to do different things with my, just adapt to the challenges of sometimes daily life, but also the, the challenges that I find outdoors, whether that's climbing a mountain, climbing trees, things like that. Um, one of the tough things for me was to actually learn how to tie my shoes again. As an athlete, I do this two or three times a day. And so when I was younger, I was, I was, you know, I was young enough that I could still get Velcro shoes, but I was also a big guy. So I kind of grew out of uh, Velcro shoes really quickly. And so then I really had to learn how to tie my lace. And finally, uh, I found a way where I could use my teeth to pull the lace. And that's how I learned how to tie my shoes and still do today. Um, and so there's all these little challenges that I had to find along the way and, um, you know, holding a tomato to cut so I can slice it for uh, dinner or for lunch or things like that. There's always these little challenges that I still find and just go through your daily routine and, and try to do things with one hand um, and just, uh, you know, have some fun with it, challenge a, a classmate or a sibling to try something with one hand. If anyone can do a one-handed push-up, uh, that's the best challenge. Awesome challenge accepted. That's uh, you know, such a visual and, and kind of personable examples of, of taking such, you know, you know, a, an accident like like at, on the farm and, and turning it into something that, like a career and, and the mindset you have. So thanks for sharing that, Mark. I yeah, a one-handed push-up. Next level. Um and, and athletes are faced with this every day, whether it's a small challenge, whether it's a larger challenge. And I'm wondering, um, Megan, she's, you know, makes skiing look very easy. She makes shooting a target look very easy. And uh, Megan was the first Canadian to win a gold medal at the Biathlon World Junior Championships. And she had to overcome challenges then. She's overcoming challenges every day now. I'm wondering if there's something that you, that you've overcome that you're really proud of, Megan? Yeah, um, oh, I think as athletes, we've all overcome different challenges. Um, I guess, uh, well, one, one challenge that I'm facing right now that I'm sort of overcoming um, is I've had um, a bit of a knee injury that has stumped a lot of um, health professionals. Um, to try and figure out how to um, fix it and solve that. And so for the past, uh, I guess since March this year, I've been struggling with that. Um, and yeah, it's meant that I haven't really been able to ski, haven't been able to run. Um, and I've really had to modify my training. And it's been pretty challenging, um, in part because I haven't really been able to train with anyone else, um, because I've had very different training. And so, yeah, I would say that really makes it slightly more challenging to, you know, get up and go do those harder workouts. Um, or for me, they've been sort of <laughs> a little mundane, short workouts. Um, and so, yeah, but in the past, 
um, three weeks, it's been feeling a lot better. Um, and I've been able to, in the summer, um, for cross country skiing and biathlon, we train on roller skis. So they're fun little things without brakes that we strap onto our feet and try not to hurt ourselves too bad with. Um, but I've been, uh, I've been able to roller ski again. So that's been really exciting. And to just kind of be able to get back to something that I really love doing um, and being able to feel actually like I'm training for what I really love to compete in has been really exciting. And, and getting that sort of taste of skiing again, I've been like, oh yeah, this is, this is why I do this sport, even on the hard days, because I just love getting outside and getting to ski and run. And yeah, it's, it's a huge privilege, but I'm always really happy to be able to do that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing me. And it takes a lot of you know, bravery to go out every single day. And, and I heard Megan say like, and there was tiny little things. And, and I also heard Megan say she kept trying at it. So yeah, an incredible amount of persistence and, and patience. And I, where I'm at right now, I also have a knee injury. I can, you know, totally relate to those, those stumped positions that are like, what, you know, why isn't this working? And, and it's, it's that inner, you know, passion, that's in that inner love. She loves doing what she, what uh, what sport she's chosen. So thanks for sharing that, Megan. We only have a couple minutes left um, before we go into our questions. And there's so many questions I wanna ask all of you all the time. Um, but I'm going to ask uh, maybe Jess to close off before, um, before we go into our questions from the audience. Let's pretend that there's a 10 year old Jess sitting right beside you. I'm wondering, knowing what you know now, what would you tell yourself? Oh, uh, probably buy as much Bitcoin as you can. Don't buy five cent candies, just buy a bunch of Bitcoin. Um, and then I'd probably impart a little bit of my experiential wisdom of being an athlete. And uh, I, I, I had really a great career. I just felt like there was times that it, the focus was not necessarily on the process, you know, it's really great to think about how do I improve? How do I get better? It's just sort of this like uh, kind of vague target. Like what is improving? Is it going five seconds faster or is it going 10 minutes faster? Um, and I, I think you can improve really well doing that, but I got really focused on like winning a race and that really narrowed my focus um, to basically getting feedback uh, that's positive only if you win the race. So it wasn't very productive to have that as the target because there's very few outcomes that give you a check mark for you know improving, um, enjoying the sport, uh, being a good teammate. Like there's a lot of things that uh, you can you can grow in and, and have a, a direction of uh, self growth when you're just trying to improve, um, and it's really narrow when you're just trying to win a race. So I think I would tell ten year old Jess like just keep focused on the process. Like don't get super focused on the goal being a specific race result, because, you know, generally those will take care of themselves. Like if you put that in the bucket with just getting, getting better, enjoying the process, like really valuing the journey more than the destination, I think is a really big thing I would share with 10 year old Jess, but yeah, first things first, buy as much Bitcoin as possible and then just enjoy life after that. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Jess. We, uh, yeah, we have a lot of wisdom inside of us and, and that's a great point to like broaden your perspective and keep it focused on the process. I find for myself to, to leave, you know, this thing in front of me, to leave this thing in front of me. And even sometimes there's a thing in front of me here to leave the screens behind is a great way for me to to broaden my focus. And as soon as I step outside, it, it really is not an exaggeration that my perspective is lifted and and I feel that you know there's this whole bigger world that's not about you know winning this one race I'll, I'll yeah thanks for sharing that um I'd like to invite Stephanie to come back on and I think we'll open up the chat at this point yeah perfect thank you Heidi and thanks to all of our panelists for those insightful and genuine responses 
I'd like to comment on resilience in particular. It's such an important characteristic at any age, really, and seeing how you've all overcome both physical and mental health barriers and didn't give up is really powerful. Um, and taking that bad situation and learning from it is a super important lesson. Um, and it's amazing to hear Mark's story of resilience after losing your arm in that accident. So thanks for sharing that, Mark. And thanks again to everyone for sharing their answers and being part of this important discussion. Heidi, you asked some fantastic questions that generated uh, this fantastic space for our mental and physical health discussions. So thank you for that. And now we'd like to turn it over to the audience to ask your questions. So the chat is gonna be turned on shortly. Um, we ask that, you know, this is a safe space for all. Um, so please be respectful in the questions that you ask. We ask that only the teachers ask questions on behalf of the students in the chat. So the chat feature will be turned on now. You'll have the ability to ask some questions and then we will turn it off in a little bit. Awesome, thanks Steph. Um, given that we only have 10 minutes here, I might rephrase some of the questions to fit uh, a couple and just target one athlete uh, per question. There's lots coming in. I see hello from PEI, I see hello from, from Calgary as well. Um, Christina, I would like to ask you, this is from a chat question here. What is your favorite song to listen to before competing? Oh gosh, mine kind of change. Um, it depends what mood I'm in. Like if I feel like I need to get motivated, then I'll listen to some more like Eminem or Drake. But then if I feel like I need to get more calmed down. So like kind of this summer when I was competing, um i was already super hyped so i just needed to kind of settle down and i actually listened to dermont kennedy um uh just kind of settling and a little deeper of a voice and uh it just kind of gets me in the in the right mind frame that i need to be in in order to compete awesome thank you oh there's so many messages coming in <laughs> so exciting. i wish i could answer them all um i am going to go to the next question, kind of rephrase the question here. I'll give this to, um, to Megan. I would like to know who inspired you to become a biathlete? Oh, um, hmm. Um, well, I definitely uh, was pretty inspired by um, like Becky Scott and Sarah Renner, um, as well as Chandra Crawford, who are all cross country skiers. Um, who are very successful um, and kind of showed what uh, is possible for Canadian women on the sort of international stage in skiing. And I, when I was little, I had all of their um, signatures, autographs on cards above my bed. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess, and then in biathlon, so the more I got to know the sport and got into it, um, yeah, just inspired by all the older athletes and the athletes on the national team for sure yeah awesome um someone wants to know at what age did you start skiing megan um i started skiing i think when i was three okay. um, and then i started biathlon at about 11. okay yeah. and this is to all the panelists we'll just get you to raise your hand do you speak french panelists if you can raise a hand okay we're gonna have to do a whole other panel in french for next time um all right I have another question. Um, maybe I'll ask Mark for this one. This is, uh, how do you set your goals? Wow, okay. Um, for me, I, there's different tiers of setting goals. For me, the big one is, what's your big dream? What's your aspiration to achieve? And that's kind of your, your long-term goal. Uh, for me, for an example right now, it's the games, the Paralympic games that are only, what are we, five months away now? Uh, it's getting a little close, but this is something I set four years ahead of time, and that's my goal. But for me, kind of going with what Jess was saying, it's the process getting there. It's not just doing well at the games. I want to be able to, when I start go to the start line, I'm the best prepared that I can be. And then I lay down that the best race I can. So when I cross the finish line, I kind of just put the cards on the table and say, can anyone beat that? And if that's, if someone can be faster, that's, you know, 
good for them. If I'm the fastest that day, then, you know, congratulations. But uh, it's also the, I think more importantly, it's the goals that come along the way. You know, if I want to achieve success at the Paralympics, what do I have to do the year before or two years before? You know, I have to do well at World Cups. I have to do well at uh, World Championships. And then I, t I love, and I think this is the most important one for me is what do you do to achieve those shorter term goals? What do you do every day in order to achieve your goals? So sometimes that is my goal is I need to eat an apple because I, nutrition is important. I need to get in this one hour today, or I need to do, you know, I have to go and wax five pairs of skis because I need them to test for tomorrow. And it's just these small little steps. Uh, maybe for you, it's like, okay, tonight I have to do this homework. Tomorrow, my goal is I need to work on a project that's coming up, uh, you know, due next week. It's these little things that your everyday goals, I think those are the ones that really allow you to take that step forward. And after, you know, a few weeks of these everyday goals, these steps, you've come a long distance. And I think that's a, a big key to how I determine um, goals and set goals and, and go, like Jeff said, doing that process in order to achieve success. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we're going to take two more questions. We have just three more minutes. Um, Jess, if you could give us an idea as to how you managed training and school and keep it gem like as condensed. Yeah, time management. Um, and what I really found uh, worked great as a student athlete was um, just being in the moment and being fully physically in the moment and then mentally in the moment. So I would just treat my training for skiing um, as like uh, an oasis where I did not have to think about statistics homework or economics equations or you know literary themes for the book I'm reading in English. And it's just a chance for me to like push my body as hard as I can, give my brain a break, and then totally flip the script when I sit down at the desk again and let my body relax and turn the brain on and try to do the best job I can in school. And I found that was really helpful to have like a yin yang, like a very opposite thing that I had had training and racing uh, balanced with school because yeah, it's, it's, I thought it was really, really fun to balance those two things. Yeah, to have to have a switch to have kind of like this is time that I've dedicated to training and use it to the best of its ability possibility and not be distracted by all these other things. Yeah, thanks for that, Jess. Um, okay, we'll do, I think we have last question for Christina. Um, how do your teammates help you? Oh, nice. Um, in so many ways. Uh, first, just having other people who are like-minded, uh, who are also focused on a similar or the same goal as yourself, allows you to kind of push yourself to new limits that you never even thought were possible. Uh, and then also just that same sort of support. Everybody needs support and having a team that you feel fully supports you and you can also support them, I think is so important. And it allows you to once again, push those boundaries that you never thought were possible. So support, they have, you have a lot of fun with teammates. Um, it's kind of just like having a big family. It's awesome. I grew up in, in kind of a big family. There's six of us. And so I feel like I was kind of always looking for that other avenue wherever I went of having um, friends and teammates. And um, that's been a huge part of the reason why I am uh, the person that I am is because of my teammates, so. Awesome, thank you for sharing. I don't know about you, but I've been keeping track of all the times where someone's like, oh yeah, injured, been there. You know, been cold, yeah, been there. There's so many, you know, even within this group of people, so much diversity, but a lot of commonality here. So thanks for sharing that. You know, I've had teammates pick me up and, and pat me on the back after a hard race. You've had the family members that have been there, you know, time and again. Um, yeah, and I, I really appreciate everyone for, for sharing so genuinely today. There are 60 new messages and I didn't even read the 100 before that. Thank you so much to everyone in the chat group. This is so fun. I, I, I wonder if there's a way if I could ask tech support Colin to save this chat um, and, and we could you know facilitate some sort of Q&A that takes place virtually to be discussed later. 
Um, yeah, we'll look into that. Yeah, for sure. That's a good idea. But thanks everyone for your questions. Like I, Heidi had said, it's so great to see the excitement in the chat. We're really sorry we can't get to all of them because there are just so many. But again, thank you so much for asking those questions and for being very respectful in doing so. Yeah. So we're going to uh, turn off the, ch the chat now, actually. We're going to turn it off and we're going to transition to Heidi to start another sharing circle with the panelists. Yeah, awesome. So we have a few more minutes left and we'll keep these last sentiments um, as gem-like as possible to cram all of that goodness into one shining diamond of comments. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with my own item here. We'll start with an item and then you can describe um, why you're proud of that item. And, and maybe any, any thank you if you have I want to say a quick thank you to anyone who's listening and then I'll pass that pass that on and we'll we'll finish the closing circle in that um so I brought an, a, a hat with me maybe I'll put it on the right way this cowboy hat I'm really proud of because it has signatures from all a lot of I had it on the wrong way <laughs> inspiring Olympians that I met along the way and it's a reminder to me that I'm one person, but I'm, I'm connected and, and I'm so much a part of, of something bigger than just myself. So that's why I'm really proud of, of, of being able to represent Canada. Uh, thank you all for being here today. I'm gonna to pass this along to Mark. Thanks. I actually have a very similar hat and it's awesome. Uh, but for my little piece, it's this is one of the targets I saved. Um, and it really is something special because if you can look, try to bring it really close, it's almost perfect. And this was my first bout of five shots at um, an event in Sweden. And about 30 minutes later, I would win my first world championship medal. So this was the first time I fired my rifle that day. And I've kept this piece of paper and that was in the date says 2011. So I've kept this piece of paper for a long time, but um, it was just something really special for me to have that target and be like, okay, that's the mindset that I'm in. I'm in, I'm, everything's going well, I'm ready, and this is going to be a good day. And uh, yeah, to win a few minutes later, to win my first world championship medal was uh, quite special to me. So I'll pass this on. I don't, I think it's Megan I'm passing this to, so. It's all you, Megan. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, where are we at? Here we go. So I have a race bib here. Um, it's a relay bib. And this is from a relay that um, our women's team did in a place called Hochfilzen in Austria. And um, it was a really special race. Um, our team ended up coming fifth, which is uh, one of the best results that um, the women's team has had um, on the World Cup. And yeah, it was just, uh, it was sort of challenging conditions. It was pretty windy. Lots of the top teams were missing and not having great days. And our team was just pretty consistent going through. Every member had a really good, good shooting, good skiing, stuck with the group. And yeah, just the whole, I, I was, I guess I was, I was second um to go and then I sort of uh tagged my next teammate they went um and I just waited in the finish area and I was so excited just screaming um because yeah we were sort of in around metal contention the whole way and then the last loop it was a sprint finish um and we just got fifth um, we were really close to a couple seconds off third so it was a really really exciting day and to do it with the whole team was super super exciting and i will pass this to chris nice thanks megan um i love hearing these stories they're really cool uh, for me, I decide to also bring a hat actually, but it's not really about the hat. It's more just what's on the hat. Um, and it has Wolf Island, which is just where I'm from. Um, and actually when I competed this summer, then Wolf Island got together and did like a full day parade, uh, when I was away in Tokyo and, 
Um, there was horses and tractors and everything that just about 200 different vehicles that went past my house um, to kind of show their support for me. And so anything really Wolf Island means a lot to me. Um, it's such an amazing community. It's a small town, but everybody supports each other. Um, and so that's always been a, a big part of of my journey as an athlete is where I'm from. And I will pass to Jess. Thanks everyone. Thanks Christina. And uh, I brought my jacket, which is um, got my home club. Megan and I are actually from, and Heidi is from the same club. We're all three from the same club. It's Foothills Nordic. And uh, it's a jacket that uh, all the coaches get uh, to coach uh, their groups. And I coach generally the high school aged skiers. And um, it's been really my best contribution to the ski community has been as a coach. And uh, it's just been such a like delight to be able to be part of other younger people's careers and to share a little bit of uh, you know, probably not a little bit, probably a lot of my enthusiasm for cross country skiing with younger generations. Cause, um, I actually got a chance to, while I was coaching a couple of years ago, uh, still compete as an athlete. So I got to have like the two way street of being, uh, an athlete alongside some of the, the kids I was coaching, you know, share a lot of the wisdom that I have, uh, gar gathered over the years. Um, and just really made this like really fun, uh, community contribution, um, which I still get to do today as a coach. I don't race for myself anymore, but I, I still make time to coach. And um, I'd say it's it's definitely the, the strongest community within the ski community that I'm a part of. And um, yeah, the jacket is just kind of like our visual representation of that. It's it's beat up, it's worn out. It's been through the ringer quite a few times, but it keeps me warm and keeps me dry. So yeah, it's pretty nice. Awesome. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Megan and Christina for making time in your busy uh, schedules for us today. Thank you to each and every classroom. We can't see you. We have no idea who we're talking to, but I feel that our excitement is nothing but contagious. Um, and I hope that there's a time today and tomorrow and the next day that you can close the screen, you can put your phones down and you can, you can explore the outdoors uh, that, that Canadians we're so lucky to have. Um, I'm gonna pass it on to Stephanie and she has a couple of prizes to tell us about. Thank you once again. And uh, I hope to see you in person outdoors one day. Awesome. Thank you so much, Heidi. And thank you to all of our panelists that could be here with us today. Thank you everyone in the audience for your participation and being here today in general to support uh, Take Me Outside's Health and Wellbeing Day as part of Take Me Outside Week. And again, our sincere thanks and gratitude to our amazing Olympic athlete panel today. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your genuine discussions and thank you for sharing all of your stories. Each of you have shown your support in nurturing young students and athletes in all aspects of health, both mental and physical, and the benefits of spending time outdoors. Um, you've given us some great lessons in resilience and optimism and goal settings. And I think I speak on behalf of everyone here saying how grateful we really are for that. You all have definitely inspired everyone in here today to get outside and spend some time outdoors being active. So again, thank you. All right, we're getting into the prizes now, everyone, to end off our session. So we'd like to thank our partners, Canada's nonprofit Outdoor Learning Store for their support throughout the Take Me Outside day and week. The Outdoor Learning Store offers supplies for teachers to help them get their students outside. Um, so you can check them out in the link that will be on in the chat shortly. Thanks to our partner MEC for their continued support and MEC will be donating two gift cards uh, for this session. The winners of the prizes of those gift cards will be announced here and we're going to put our info at email in the chat. Um, so please, if you hear your name called, uh, reach out to us through that email so you can claim your prize. All right, so for the first winner, $50 MEC gift card, it is Nadine Trumbly. So Nadine Trumbly, if you are here, please uh, make sure to reach out to us. Congrats, Nadine. And the second winner is Mr. Fleming's class. Mr. Fleming's class, congratulations. So again, please make sure you reach out to us using that email in the chat to claim your prize. 
Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today. Please join us in our afternoon yoga session at 2.30 Eastern time, if you can. That's for grades 7 to 12. We hope you all have a fantastic time and really spend time outdoors tomorrow for Take Me Outside Day. We're looking to see, uh, we're looking forward to seeing your photos and your pictures um, spending time outdoors. So please use our hashtag Take Me Outside. Teachers or educators, as a reminder, we have a webinar tonight with Great Minds Think Outdoors at 6 p.m. Eastern. So we'd love to see you there. And you'll be also winning a prize for your attendance tonight as well. Take a look at our website um, for more events to come for tomorrow and Thursday. We hope to see you guys in our upcoming events and I hope that everyone has a fantastic day. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. That was fantastic. Thanks again for being here guys. It was really nice. <laughs>